Hi everybody, welcome back. So I'm trying something new here for the, our, uh, our budget troubleshooting video. And what I'm going to use is one of these combination soldering iron and solder suckers. I just plugged it in and just tinned the tip a little bit. And you can see how much it's smoking right now. So I may have to turn on my fume extractor because while this heating element kind of burns in, it's going to stink and smoke for a while. But I really want to see how these work. I bought one of these probably 30 years ago, and it didn't work so well. Uh, it didn't get hot enough, but this one seems to be getting really hot, and it may work. So let me turn on the fume extractor. You're going to hear some noise during this video because I have to run that to get rid of this smoke. But uh, hopefully you'll be able to hear what's going on. Yeah, that thing is stinky. But uh, so I have it on low. Hopefully that'll be enough to extract the fumes and uh, still be able to hear. So let's see how this thing works. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove, I'm going to start out with one of these small capacitors up here. Get this out over here. And I'm just gonna arm it and go right in here. Maybe one. I'll tell you the plunger doesn't move very fast. I don't know why, but it worked. Wow. <laughs> Look at that. Took it right out. You know, this thing was only like 20 bucks or something. It was really cheap. I'll give you the name of it. It has a little indicator light. And it's made, I've seen this brand before. I don't know if you can see it clearly or not. Let's see if it'll focus here. Come on. There we go. So there, you, there it is. Okay. So let's put one of these in. This is a 3.3 at 25. I'm going to put one of these little tiny 3.3 at 50s. Nichicon Golds. Which I think will work quite well. Get the soldering iron. Boy, that really cleaned that solder joint off well. I'm surprised. I'm going to be reaching around you here because everything's kind of cluttered everywhere at the moment. Hey, a neat workbench is a sign of a disturbed mind. <laughs> Gotta have a messy workbench. It means you're having fun. Okay, so let's... Uh, Let's step it up a little bit. Let's go to this capacitor right here, which is a lot larger. Let's see if we can get that to come out. Let's see here. Wow, just like nothing. And I think you spend all that money on a Wow. I mean, I literally just did a quick search online for desoldering pump or whatever. And that thing popped up and I bought it because it was cheap. Okay, so the positives on this side here. And we have to get rid of some of this. It even pulled some of the... That glue is nasty stuff. You can see, and it's just at that consistency right now that you can usually peel it off like that. It hasn't hardened and turned completely corrosive yet. 
although the stuff on the bottom of the board seems to have done that. So, very cool. Let me finish cleaning this up a little bit, and I'll be right back. Okay, there's the old 220 at 50, and here's the new one. And you can see the pin spacing isn't correct, so what we're going to do is I'm just going to make the pin spacing a little bit wider. You want to bend it down a little bit from the bottom because you don't want it to damage where it connects in there. So it's something like that. That should be pretty close. And then the positive goes on that side. Yeah, and it looks perfect. Okay. Very good. Okay. Well, it looks as if the... And it's still smoking a little bit. You can just barely see it there. But this heating element kind of has to burn in before it stops smoking like that. And Once it does, I'm going to probably turn this air handler off because it's, it's rather loud and in the way. And I'm going to reflow this. There we go. Okay. Let's go to the next one. So far, I'm liking this thing for what it is. Now let's try this one here. Let's make sure I'm on it. Won't help to. This thing really works. <laughs> Capacitor literally just fell right out. And I gotta clean it a little bit more. Okay, this thing is pretty cool. I don't know how long it's gonna last, but uh, yeah. 16 volts, 47 microfarads. would be this one. 37 at 16. Alright, so as I promised, we'll probably do a solder and chat. And let me turn this thing off because I think eh, it's still got a little bit of smoke. We'll give it another minute or two. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, I had an interesting experience and the other day and so I thought I would document it to share with some of you and uh, I think I'm going to turn this off now hold on so I was looking up some information just to see how good you know I'm kind of interested in this whole chat GPT slash you know Google Bard and all these so-called AI engines and trying to determine whether it's artificial intelligence or idiotic intelligence <laughs> or <laughs> artificial idiot I don't know but uh, I asked it a couple questions concerning transistors because you know I just did a video on uh, some transistor theory and I just wanted to see what chat GPT and what Google Bard what kind of information it would give specifically talking about things like 
how uh, temperature and different things affect the gain of a transistor. And I'd have to look up, I, I actually did a screenshot of the questions that I asked, the answers that it gave. And I'll put that up on the screen while we're doing this. And I can't remember exactly the context of what, what I asked it, but it was completely wrong. I mean, and the thing I notice about all of these chat engines is that when they give you an answer to something, it answers it as, as if it is absolute fact, even if it's completely wrong. And if you're not the type to have a little bit of experience with uh, the subject that you're talking about, it's, I think it could be really easy to be misled or incorrectly educated about something and give you completely the wrong answer. In this case, it, it was totally wrong. <laughs> and when I said, and, I, and again, I'll put the conversation up on the screen. I put on, you know, I answered by saying something to the effect that, gee, I didn't know that. I was under the impression it worked this way. And all of a sudden, it completely changed its story and said, oh, I'm sorry, you know. Uh, you're correct. And then it put up another little chart or whatever to explain it, and it was wrong again. And I said, but I, that doesn't explain what you just said <laughs> was true. You're, you know, oh, I'm sorry again. And it does the same thing again. And that was, I believe, Google Bard this time. And so I thought, you know, this is interesting. Let's go to ChatGPT 3.5 and see what it says. And so therefore I went to that and I asked the same question. I worded it in the same words and lo and behold, it actually first try, it gave the correct answer and actually worded it in a really understandable way. Now that doesn't mean that ChatGPT is better than Bard because this isn't the first time I've had this kind of an experience. Uh, as you know from the name of my channel, I am, you know, by my career, my day job is I work on medical imaging and x-ray. And I, although this is just a hobby and I don't really know everything about this kind of electronics, I am very well versed in uh, medical imaging and x-ray. And I was asking it some questions about different types of uh, digital detectors, like amorphous silicon cesium detectors versus a selenium direct conversion detectors and things. I know a lot of you probably aren't following what I'm saying with that, but suffice it to say, it's something that's pretty well known in the medical industry now. And it did, chat GPT basically did the same thing. It was totally, completely wrong, gave the complete opposite of what the correct answer would be. And when I questioned it, it reversed course and apologized and all that. Now, I'm not saying that these search engines, these AI engines are bad or that they're not useful. They're very useful. And I see very good potential for them in the future. But you have to understand they're only as good as the data that they have. And since they are affected by the interaction with people, it means that if people that don't know what they're saying interact with it enough times, it'll change the weighting of its, you know, of the answers for that, and it will not give you accurate information. And my whole point is, on all of this, is nothing will ever substitute your mind. It's nice to have little gadgets that can help you do things with, you know, making less effort, but you still have to think for yourself. For those of you who don't and try to take the short way out, you're going to find that you'll be disappointed quite often. 
because you're going to find out that a lot of the things you're doing or saying or, or, or learn, finding online are not correct. Now, it's always been that way with the Internet, but I think people tend to look at uh, these chat engines as being a lot more uh, reliable than just a regular search engine, but that is not always true. So, long story short, there, in my opinion, there will never be a substitution for using your mind and for doing the work. Uh, you know, I was appalled that my son came to me last year. Uh, you know, he's finishing up his degree. He's got a job already in the uh, electronics industry. And one of his professors basically told him, told this class that uh, that uh, they can use chat GPT and it's not gonna be necessary to learn this anymore. And he was going on and on about it. He, I mean, he totally drank the Kool-Aid on this thing. And I was appalled to hear that. Yes, chat GPT can, and, and these AI engines can write software code and things and speed things up for you. But guess what? It's still going to be wrong. You're, there are going to be mistakes and you're going to have to correct it. You're going to have to proofread it. And in order to proofread it accurately, you still need to know what you're doing. And so I told him, I said, you know, that professor, I'm sorry, is wrong. And, uh, you know, don't ever, of course, my son never would have anyhow. He's a what if type of person. So he always does research more so than I do. But uh, I just couldn't believe a college professor would say that. Uh, you know, going, hearkening back to the ones that I learned under, they would have never said anything like they would have never said anything that would discourage you from thinking for yourself and uh, not just relying on others or on some technology for everything. But it seems like time and again throughout history we keep building the golden calf and this is just I don't know, this is just the latest version of the golden calf, if you ask me. Everybody will you know, be taken in by the novelty of it for a while and then figure out that uh, it's not everything that we expected. Let's see here. Where's my capacitor that I'm looking for? This is a 330 at 10. I know I have one here. Here we go. Okay, so that's my little uh, opinion about these chat engine, AI engines. Again, I use them and they have really helped move things along for me, you know, in certain instances, but there's just that little bit of, uh, you gotta, still gotta use your mind. If you go into it thinking that it's going to take the place of you having to learn something or you having to actually do something, you're going to be sadly disappointed. Uh, you still have to be you. All right. So now let's do this one. I'm going to be able to do this whole thing with this little iron. I mean, it's actually faster <laughs> than the uh, vacuum pump. I can't believe how this thing's working. So, I mean, you know, I, this is not a paid endorsement or anything. Like I said, I just bought this thing online real cheap because, again, they made these. Oh, my goodness. Back in the 1980s, you could buy these. I had one. And I never used it because it was just so bad. I mean, it just didn't, it didn't work. I hardly ever see anybody online using these, you know, in videos kind of amazes me because so far I have to admit this is better than the just the regular pump without the heat you know just the regular desoldering pumps I have lots of those and I, if you've seen me use them on my channel but wow this thing here pretty cool what's this 22 at 16 
my 22 yep 22 at 16 you can see how much smaller these things are from the originals and these are really good capacitors here these are low ESR low noise caps by various well-known manufacturers I mean you're getting to the point now the old days you could just buy all one style of capacitor you know like the Nichicon KT series or the FG's or the you know the, some of the Panasonic's or the of course the Elna's but now they're limited I mean they're discontinuing a lot of them so you got to kind of mix it up and just get whatever's the correct high quality cap from whatever manufacturer and whatever series so having all matching caps on your board on these old amps is going to be a thing of the past here pretty soon i think i mean yeah there's new old stock out there but they're not as easy to find as you might think and usually the new old stock ones people know what they have and they're going to charge you accordingly for it look at that it just falls out it cleans it so well 22 at 16 again guess what i'm short one one of the 22s at 16 so i have to grab another one which i think i have right here 22 at 16 yep there it is and these are, I don't know what these are by. I know I bought them from, uh, I think, either Mauser or DigiKey, so I know they're, and I know I only went with, you know, Elna, Panasonic, Kemet, Nichicon, you know, those names. So I know it's one of those. And these are 105 degree and I went with the lowest ESR I could get for this particular thing and being so small they're gonna be a lot lower noise too okay let's do this one this is another 47 at 16 I think I got one sitting out I tried to get out all of the ones that I saw on the board ahead of time just to kind of speed the process up let's see here I mean you just touch it and it's melted it's amazing what a little 30 watt iron can do but uh, so far so good got to heat that up a little bit more there it is 47 at 16 Let's see here, 47, forty seven at 16, here it is. That one needs a little bit bent out. Some, most of them have been close enough, but this one's a little bit, I'm going to flare this out a little. I don't even know if I'm still on camera. Yeah, I guess I am. Okay, put this in here. All right. I actually kind of like this part of doing a restoration because it's kind of therapeutic just to sit here and do this repetitive work. And talk to all of you all right okay so I'm gonna do one more on camera and then these last couple I'll finish off camera so I don't waste all the memory card I'm gonna do this big one this is the biggest capacitor on the board I think if it can clean this one off it can pretty much handle anything Wow oh. 
Look at that. Now, of course, the glue, this is glued down, so we'll have to break the glue loose, but look at that right out. And that's 470 at 63. And that would be this one here, 470 at 63. Okay. And we're going to have to open this one up a little bit, I think. Yeah, just a tiny bit. There we go. There is a little bit of glue here, but it's not touching anything metal on a board. I'm not going to waste my time cleaning it. And it's not touching this cap because it's actually outside of the where this cap sits. So I'm not going to worry about it. Okay. All right, so let me do these last few off camera and then we'll be back. Okay, the capacitors are all replaced. And, well, no, I have one left to do here, I forgot. One little capacitor, but I'll do that here when I do this. But I'm also going to look at the regulated power supply. And you have your regulating transistor and then you have your current pass transistor. And what's in here and what is listed are two different things. So if you look at this, this is called, where is this capacitor? Q750. And you can see on here, they're saying Q750 is a 2SC 1885, which is that one of these little ones again and that is not what it is. If you look on the board it's this one right here and it happens to be a 2SC 1567 and that is about a 20 watt transistor and it has a breakdown voltage of around 160 volts pretty substantial transistor compared to that other one and so I'm going to replace this one and this is a KSC 945 which is your garden variety transistor right here that's the regulator this is the pass transistor those tend to since they run warm a lot of times they tend to the gain will drop on them and they'll start to fail after a while, even if they're working now, if you run this thing any length of time, eventually these will wear out. So I'm going to preemptively <laughs> just replace them. And I'm going to use for this one, I'm going to use a little beefier transistor. I'm going to use a KSC 2073. It's a 25 watt transistor, a little bit bigger package, and a very similar voltage and current ratings and so forth. It's actually take, a, take more current than this one. And for the current pass transistor, I'm going to use, or I mean for the regulator transistor, instead of a KSC 945, I'm going to use this KSC 2383. And again, this one's double the current rating, so it should hold up a lot better. Uh, in addition, I will check the diode, which I think is Q725, and the Zener diode, and it should be a 15 volt Zener. And it's right here. You can just kind of see it. And I'm going to replace, I'm probably going to replace that. Because um, again, those diodes will drift. Their Zener voltage will drift with age after a while, especially if they've been running warm for any length of time. The rest of the transistors on this board should be okay. I'm not going to worry about them. And uh, But the power supply ones, definitely you want to kind of, deal with that.
Okay, last but not least, I'm pulling this relay and look how this thing works on these big relay terminals. Just pulls it right out. Usually within one or two, sometimes you need a second one, but look how clean that's getting at. It always impresses me when something like this works because usually these things are, you know, you get them online really cheap and they just don't work. And you just waste your money on more Chinese junk. But I got to admit, this one here, so far so good. Now maybe the quality control isn't there. Maybe they're not all this good when they come in. I don't know. But all I can say is for these ones, I'm impressed. I mean, it's just so effortless. Look at that. <laughs> Relay fell right out. Unbelievable. Okay, so I'm just going to replace this. The owner, uh, the person that... My buddy Dave, this is his unit. And you can see this has been pried off. So obviously somebody's tried to clean it at some point in time. So I'm just going to put a new one in. I'm just going to use one of these. He, uh, Dave got this one for me. I think it'll be just fine. Okay, I have the relay replaced. All the capacitors are done. The transistors and the power supply are done. I cleaned all the controls, cleaned the board. I think the rest of it's going to be okay. And now I'm going to just work on replacing these speaker wires. These are 22 gauge wire, which is kind of thin. I'm going to replace it with new 20 gauge wire. You can see these look kind of tarnished and worn. So uh, is it absolutely necessary? Probably not, but since we we're in here, we might as well do it. So, uh, so this is number two R. So I'm going to use the purple wire for that. And uh, Speaker 2, I'm just going to make the color code for the rear speaker of a car stereo. <laughs> and speaker 1, I'm going to use the color code for the front, you know, speakers. And uh, I heard a very large bug buzzing around here a minute ago. It sounded like a bee or something. So keep my eye open for that, I guess. Okay, so to R, I'll take this one off here with the unwrap tool. And that gives me a chance to show you how the wire wrap tool works. So you have this two holes, one on the side and one in the center. This wire here, which I'm going with the number 20 gauge, which is about as big as you can do wire wrap with with this kind of a tool. It just slides over there and then you just kind of rotate it and it very tightly attaches it to that post. You can see that's it and it looks very professional when it's done. And then I'll just mark that with another piece of tape. Probably don't have to but again I just want to make sure that we get everything right. Take an extra minute to mark things now and then you don't have to spend a lot of time later trying to figure out what you're doing which is the way I normally do it there's that daggone thing it is a bee okay the bee is outside where he belongs all right now we're gonna do speaker one right which is going to be the gray wire. So same process. Isn't this fun? Actually, I think it is. And I'll be honest, I probably don't even have to do the 
heat sink grease or anything like that on the on the output transistors because Marantz in this era used this clear it's a really oily kind of grease it's not the the white silicon stuff you're used to seeing and it doesn't dry out and it really really lasts and I very rarely have any problems with it um, so really it's just a matter of for your own you know obsessive compulsiveness if you want to redo those usually I'll look at it and see what it looks like the other thing is the glue is still on the screws you know the thread lock so that tells me nobody has had those transistors out so chances are the grease is still good I really don't have to mess with it I can just clean up around it so so very very good okay now again I could probably just leave these as is but I really would prefer to put a little drop of solder on them when these standoff posts are brand new they're very shiny and what happens is when you turn this twist this wire on there the wire actually bites they're square if you if you I don't know if you can see it closely enough or not but they're square they're not round and the corners of this kind of bite into the wires but they get tarnished with age so by putting a drop of solder on there the flux and everything helps clean that off and makes a little better bond and you don't hundred percent have to do that but I don't know to me it's just a little again extra insurance so I will probably do that but you can see how neat that and by the way I I actually purchased this on Amazon I have a couple of them but this one I, I particularly like and uh, it was rather inexpensive and it's very good quality I don't so I uh, you know if you want to look on Amazon for wire wrap tool there's automatic ones too that are really expensive but you don't need that all right let's put a drop on here of solder touch it up and then where I'm going to end this video I'm going to spend the rest of this video I'm going to just to do a quick rundown on the schematic because I had a viewer question from the last video and I'm gonna try to answer it because I think it was a good question we'll take a look and see if we can answer it all right all done I think this board's good to go I don't see any reason that to replace anything else I looked at the transistors that are used on these none of them seem to be ones that that, that at least that I'm aware of that are problematic so I think I'm just gonna yeah these all look like pretty good transistors so I'm not gonna worry about it and uh, good enough okay I'm gonna spend the last part of this video uh, first of all trying to stay in frame <laughs> with the camera but uh, trying to answer a question that one of you viewers posted on the last part of this video and it was a really interesting question and uh, I thought I would take a little bit of time to address it uh, basically what he asked was looking at the schematic and you know I had the schematic up on the screen in the last video that the bias circuit of this amplifier looks a little bit confusing and I have to agree with that when I first looked at this schematic I thought the same thing it's not really laid out you know on the paper here the way that it would normally be on other amplifier schematics so that poses the question is this a unique bias circuit or is it just a standard one that's just kind of they rearranged the furniture <laughs> uh, in the living room so let's see if we can figure this out first of all we know that this is a complementary amplifier. You have your outputs, you know, NPN and PNP. And we have our two driver transistors, which are also 
NPN and PNP. And this whole section in here has to do with your overload protection. And what this does is if there is excessive current, this whole center line here, this is the part that if you follow it, it will go out to the speaker. And this is, this is your, this drives the speakers. Uh, it's kind of hard to, to visualize that there, but that is in fact what's going on. Because if you see this comes back here, these emitters, they come back through these resistors here. And these are called, they're very low resistance, 0.39 ohms at five watts. Those are your emitter resistors. Those kind of, we'll get in maybe another video what the purpose of those is, but essentially they're very low resistance. So the emitters connect together at this point, and this is where you go out to your, uh, to the speaker itself, the speaker connections. And if there is any kind of overcurrent situation. You can see your speaker lead comes down here and goes into this network here and through your relay, your protect circuit and all that. But if there's excessive current here, that'll be sensed by this little network, these diodes and so forth. And it'll start to turn these two transistors on. And as these transistors begin to turn on, they are in there to bypass some of the signal, some of your drive signal around these driver transistors, which will reduce the output, which will reduce the drive into your, into your outputs and into your speaker. So it's an overload protection circuit and it's, it's active. It, it works in real time as, the, you know, as your music is playing if you overdrive it. So you can take this whole circuit out and the amplifier will still work. It'll just go into really bad hard clipping and high current <laughs> if you drive it too hard. So we can ignore that part. If we look up here, there's a few components that may look familiar if you've ever seen a, you know, a bias spreader circuit, you know, in the, this complementary amplifier design. And these are called direct coupled amplifiers because if you notice every stage couples to the next stage directly without having a capacitor in there to isolate the two sides. So they all are susceptible to whatever DC level there is on the stage before. And that's called direct coupled. And uh, this bias circuit is actually pretty standard, but it's in there in a weird way that's hard to understand. This pot right here, its whole purpose is to set the DC balance so that there is zero volts at idle on your speaker terminal. And that really feeds back and it, it, it adjusts this circuit here at the front end, uh, which is your differential pair. And this, this part here is your class A input driver. And this side is your negative feedback. And you can see it comes right back from your speaker terminal through this 33K resistor, which controls the amount of feedback and into this little network here and right down into there. See that? So this will oppose this. And that's, that's part of the reason that these amplifiers are such low distortion. That's also one of the reasons, and I'm getting off topic a little bit, that if these transistors over here aren't perfectly matched and the gain isn't the right range or something, this pretty much negates a lot of that or reduces the influence of a lot of that. So you don't really need to worry about the, you know, the gain or the matching of these as much as you might think. A lot of people get really hung up on that, but I can tell you from experience, I've not really noticed huge differences. There's always someone that'll say they can hear the difference and you probably can maybe, but I can't. Uh, that negative feedback circuit really does a good job. Anyway, how do we figure this all out? Well, whenever I can't understand a schematic, I do two things. I try to eliminate the parts that don't pertain to, to what I'm trying to understand. And I try to redraw the schematic in a simplified, reorganized way that, I, that my mind can understand it. And that's just what I did right here. 
So when we draw it this way with only the three transistors that are important right now, it makes it a lot easier to understand what's going on. The first thing you have to figure out is what's, what is the purpose of a bias circuit? Um, most of the way that the question was posed to me indicates that this person understands how that works already. So I really don't have to go over a whole lot of that. But essentially what amplifier bias is, is that we want these transistors to just be to their turn on point where they're starting to conduct current between the emitter and collector, or yeah, collector and emitter. And in order to do that, you have to have a little bit of base current flowing, just enough to turn the transistor on. You don't want it to be sitting there idle at too much current, or it's just going to waste energy and, and create heat. But you want it to be ready that when you, when you start to drive a signal in here, it, you don't have to wait for the transistor to turn on and forward bias before it starts to conduct out to the speaker. And that's the whole purpose of bias. The other thing is, since this is a push-pull amplifier, you don't want one of these transistors, you don't want both transistors to ever be off at the same time. You always want them to overlap one another. So in the positive half cycle, you know, whenever you're driving the signal in the positive direction, positive voltage, this transistor is going to increase in amplitude, right, the output. And this one's going to decrease. And what's going to happen is you want the point, you want this transistor to be well into its conducting point before this one turns off. Now we can get into amplifier classes, you know. If the amp if these transistors are just barely turned on in their idle, you know, with the bias circuit, we call that class A B. And essentially that's the most efficient way to drive this because you're not wasting a lot of current, you know, idling when there's no signal, but yet you're not going to get any crossover distortion. And again, if both of these transistors ever turn off at the same time, you'll have a dead spot <laughs> in your signal. And so instead of having a sine wave, for instance, you'll have a sine wave with a little gap in it, you know, between the positive and negative half. That's called crossover distortion. When you cross over from positive to negative voltage, you don't want any dead time in there. And that's what this bias does. You just barely want it enough that this, this transistor's conducting before this one turns off, and this transistor's conducting before this one turns off. Now, if you turn that bias way up to where you have a lot more current flowing, first of all, these things are gonna run really hot. Second of all, you're getting more into class A. Class A is where you're kind of running these transistors at their midpoint of operating. And then you're going up and down from that. And of course, some amplifiers are really, the more exotic designs will run in class A like that for low signal. And then when you drive real heavy, you know, real high volume, high power, they revert to class AB. Some people believe that is a, you get better, more accurate sound or lower distortion. So you'll see that, but most of them are like this, class AB. Now that we got that out of the way, <laughs> you'll see in order to get a certain amount of current flowing, you have your voltage, forward voltage drop on the transistor. And we talked about that in other videos. And it's usually about a half a volt for a silicon transistor. And as such, if you have a half a volt here, you can do the math, what's flowing through this 100 ohm resistor, okay, with respect to this negative, and you can, you can determine what the current will be. Because you're going to have an equal and opposite negative voltage drop here. So if you add these two resistors together, you have 200 ohms. If you add these, the, the total difference of these voltages, in this case, you'll have 2.2 volts. So if you take 2.2 volts, all right, I'm sorry, you have 2.2 volts between here and here, and after your forward drop, so I'm getting ahead of myself, you have about a half a volt on each side, positive and negative. 
So the, the total difference between these is one volt because you have a negative 0.5 volts and a plus 0.5 volts. And it's going to vary a little bit depending on the transistors. But just to use some round numbers, the schematics actually say that. You can see right here it says 0 0.5 volts, negative 0 0.5 volts. So let's say there's a total difference here of one volt. If you take one volt divided by the 200 ohms that's across it, you're going to get about 5 milliamps. So there's 5 milliamps of current flowing through this transistor right here. And that's going to be the emitter collector current plus the base emitter current. That's what this current is going to be right here. So you're going to have a very low amount of current here, about 5 milliamps, which is just enough when you go out to the base of your outputs here to turn them on. Because again, if you have about 5 milliamps there, that's also going to be added to the small amount. And it's going to be divided between that small amount of drop between the base and emitter of the, dry, of the output transistor. And that's going to be just enough with the lower gain of these big outputs to turn them on in the same manner. And you'll have a small amount, probably about 10 times that amount of idle current on those. So you'll have maybe somewhere between 20 and 50 milliamps of idle current on the outputs, which is just perfect for those. And that's the whole, what we want to do is set up that condition there. So, <coughs> excuse me. So this, with this, that's the whole purpose of this circuit is to make that voltage difference here so that we have this going on here. And this is how they're doing it. And I have to say, I stand corrected with the statement that I made in the previous video. If you remember, I said that you could pretty much power up that whole power amp section with just these two voltages here. You know, this one here and this one here, your positive and negative 41 volts. But that's not entirely correct because even though that's what we have out here, this bias circuit is actually powered by the regulated power supply. So there's a 35 volt regulated supply right here. It's on the same board in this amplifier. And that power supply does a whole lot. You can see it goes off the board here and it powers a whole bunch of things like your tuner and your preamps and all the tone control section. A lot of stuff like that is powered by this regulated supply. But it also comes around and it goes up here and it actually goes into this bias network. So you have your 35 volt regulated, it goes into these two resistors in series, and in between them is a capacitor, an electrolytic capacitor, and that would be this cap right here. It's 47 microfarads, and it goes to this center point right here. And this goes right here, and you see I have 1.1 volts there. Well, which is right here. Well, how does 35 volts turn into 1.1 volts? Well, that's the trick. If you notice, you have your negative DC rail, which is minus around 41 volts, it goes through this 22 ohm resistor, through this 33 ohm resistor, and at idle, you're going to have about 40, negative 40.7 volts right there. And on this differential pair, it's actually set up at idle to have a negative voltage on it. You see that there? That's going straight into there. So what that means is the difference between here and here is very small. It's only a voltage drop difference. So this is just barely turning on. Even though it's an all reference to ground, it's all negative voltage. You're going to have a little bit of, of current flowing here. It's going to amount to a minus 1.1 volt, negative 1.1 volt right here, and a positive 1.1 up here. So that current path is through here, through this bias spreader, and through here into your negative voltage. See that? So that's the actual current path. Adjusting this pot will adjust how far apart these are going to be. 
Now there's some other things in here that are necessary, and this is just a standard bias circuit. You'll see this same kind of thing in Pioneer and Marantz and a lot of other manufacturers will do the same thing. So what, what this does, and I'm wrong with this, this is not a varistor. This is a thermistor. I just noticed that. I'm gonna write that on there, thermistor. We'll get into that in a second. So the first thing, let's take this out first and look at it. You have this little device here, which is, you can see it's like off the board. And it just so happens to be this little thing here. And this is called a stabister. It's essentially a, a one package with three, with a, a semiconductor in there that has the equivalent of three diode voltage drops in it. Why use a diode? Well, we'll talk about that. If you have a diode, remember, just like our transistor, the base emitter junction, a diode has a forward voltage drop, and it's very consistent. It, it changes very, very little over changes in current and temperature. It does change a little bit, but it maintains a relatively stable voltage drop. So three voltage drops, let's say it's 0.5 volts each, I'm just rounding it up, you would have about a 1.5 volt drop across here that would stay consistent regardless of what happens between these two points. So it's going to hold that difference between these two always at that roughly you know, 1.5 volts in this case. Now, you need to be able to trim that up a little bit. And if you just put a resistor in here, that would vary greatly with changes in current and voltage, right? This, this, this whole thing would fluctuate all over the place, but this locks them in together at, a, at the same voltage difference all the time. However, it may not be the perfect amount because all, like I said, these transistors are all different. So that's what this adjustment circuit is. And the, the idea is this has a very small influence on it, on this circuit with respect to this part. So this just makes small changes. Now, this is, these four components are here for a very specific reason. First of all, potentiometers are a, they're in a, they're a place of, of failure. If this pot were to fail or this pot were to open up or something, there would be no, there would be no connection between this point and this point and these two voltages would go way up and it would turn these both on full blast and you would pretty much short out your transistors. They would go into overcurrent. So if this fails, you have this 160 ohm resistor bypassing it. And you can see it, when it's in parallel with a 1K resistor, even with this pot turned the whole way this way, you still have, this is, this is the smaller resistance, right? The lower resistance. And this just fine tunes that voltage divider here. That is all in series with a 82 ohm resistor that's in parallel with a thermistor. What is a thermistor? A thermistor is a solid state device that will change its resistance with changes in temperature. It's designed to move a lot more with temperature than this is. And if you notice, that is this component here. It's in a piece of heat shrink and it's sandwiched in between the two driver transistors. See that? So see, the, that would be these two driver transistors. This is physically connected to these. As these over, if these were to overheat because you turned the bias up too high or something, this thermistor would change and it would kind of bring things back in. And it can only adjust it within this <laughs> 82 ohm resistor here. So it makes tiny little adjustments, but that makes, you know, because of the gain of these transistors, it makes big adjustments here. So between this and this, and this is being thermally coupled to the heat sink of the outputs, these are active devices. So as the temperature of your transistors change out this way, 
this bias circuit can vary itself in the same manner as these are varying themselves with changes in temperature. And I talked about some of that and I demonstrated it on the, my uh, transistor video a couple of videos ago. And it just ensures that wherever you set this, it'll stay there. <laughs> it'll keep this 2.2 volt difference very close. And you, it's not perfect, none of them are, but it's close enough that it'll keep it pretty stable. Every the bias circuit out there, most of them, work in a similar manner to this. Now there's other ones that instead of using the Stabister and the, you know, this network, they'll use a, a, a one or two transistors in there. And it's a similar, it, it achieves the same goal of giving you that voltage drop, but this bias pot will adjust the base of the transistor and which will adjust the voltage drop across it. Those work just as well. And you know, you can either way, it's the same, you're achieving the same goal and getting that, it's called a bias spreader for a reason. You're spreading the voltage difference between the positive and negative going half cycle. I don't know if that helps any or not, but to sum up this long talk, <laughs> This is a standard bias circuit. It works pretty much like all the other ones. And you can see you have a positive and a negative voltage here. So you, this transistor can operate kind of in that area to, to vary back and forth. So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. And uh, the biggest thing is when you're working with a positive versus a negative voltage, a differential like that, a lot of this will get confusing if you try to reference everything to ground or to common because it's not working with reference to ground. It's working with reference between the positive and the negative voltage. So there you go. That's how it works in a nutshell. Uh, hopefully that'll help. Well, we've managed to waste another Lord knows how long on this thing. Uh, so I'm going to call this video part two and I'm going to get it posted up. When you see this thing next, I will put the four screws back into this and get it mounted in there. Hook up these couple of wires, hook up these two connectors to these two speaker switches. And uh, I think we'll be ready to do some testing. And uh, here's the thing. I'm not sure how I want to do this. I wanted to just use an oscilloscope on the next video. Uh, of course, you still need to use your multimeter to set the bias and, and DC balance. But really the scope is pretty worthless if you don't have a signal driving into it. So you, uh, you know, after giving it a second thought, I almost can't do an oscilloscope part of this series unless I do a signal generator part with it, because they work hand in hand. You need some sort of a signal to show up on your scope. And in order to get that signal, you have to have a source of the signal. Now, of course, I could connect a, an MP3 player or something with a tone on it like that, or we could use a, just a signal generator. If you'd like, uh, tell me in the comments and I could use something like just this low cost sine wave generator. Or if you want me to just use my regular signal generator, I can do that too. Uh, let me know in the comments and we'll decide from there. So that's it for part two. I wish you all peace, joy, happiness, and good health in your lives. And uh, not sure when I'll get this posted up because uh, the weekend is at an end and I have a very busy work week. So we'll see when this gets posted. Until then, take care everybody. And I hope this answered more questions than it created. I don't know. Hope I did a good job on that, but I'm sure I made some mistakes. Some of you more experienced audio folks out there wanna embellish on what I said, go for it. I would appreciate it. Take care everybody, bye-bye.